1976, the year of America's bicentennial, 200 years since the Declaration of Independence, and even the Queen is celebrating, along with the 38th president. It's one thing to dress a turkey, but this? This is ridiculous. It's the year of Gerald Ford's loss to Jimmy Carter, making Jerry the only two-year, never-elected president. Oh, yes, an election year, and a sporting year. Everything wants to go up. People are easy to be mystified. They always want to know what would happen if Wolfman meets Frankenstein, or if the world's greatest fighter meets the world's greatest martial art crossover. And you should see every theater's going to be packed. They're going to be lined up, $100, $200. Out jogging on the political corpses, government girl Liz Ray. Another high scorer, teeny bopper Nadia Comaneci, earns seven perfect scores at the Montreal Olympics. Idi Amin is helping terrorists. Millions mourn the death of Chairman Mao, but the Little Red Book lives on. A mysterious death for mystery man Howard Hughes. A mysterious disease, named for its legionnaire victims, closes a famous old Philadelphia hotel. I've become a candidate because I believe strongly in this American spirit to move forward. To bring love and compassion. To lift us out of the national and international morass. To run the country in a different manner than it's been run over the past. And this must change. There are those I know who say that it is too late to run for the president. But I am officially announcing that I am a candidate. I'm today announcing. I will make my case. I'd like to announce that I am a candidate for president. I'm sure that a logical question at this time would be, why are you running for president of the United States? I do so. I shall not compete I've for I've decided it. to seek the office of the president. I shall not seek I'm it. a candidate for president. I shall not search for but it. I am planning to enter the. I shall not scramble for, for the it. presidency. But I'm around. <laughs> Almost everyone is running in 76, some destined to be forgotten even before the campaign ends. They all know the rituals. Most everyone figures President Gerald Ford will win his party's nomination. Everyone but Ronald Reagan. Jerry does, finally, squeak through. On the Democratic side, there are so many donkeys in the race, no one notices an unknown who is on the rail at the first turn, ex-Georgia Governor Jimmy Carter. His smile becomes his umbrella. Not a bad candidate trademark in a country that hasn't seen a president smile since John Kennedy. Most Americans are fed up with tried and untrue Washington politicians, so Jimmy makes an asset of his inexperience. As the nation focuses on the new kid, everyone wants to know, who is Jimmy Carter? Born in the farming hamlet of Plains, Carter served in the Navy on nuclear subs, then came home to run the family business when his father died. He's not really a politician, the campaign literature implies. He's just a farm boy who ran a successful business. And he'll run the country by just such basic American principles. 
my folks have been farmers in Georgia for more than 200 years. And we've been living around here for, oh, 150 years. The Carter family dominates the little town of Plains in politics and business. This is the source of Jimmy Carter's wealth, a company that buys peanuts from local farmers, shells and grades them, then sells them to manufacturers. The biggest peanut butter factory in the United States is just down the road. Jimmy appeals to that desire to return to old values. I'll never tell a lie. I'll never make a misleading statement. I'll never betray the confidence that any of you has in me. And I will never avoid a controversial issue. I won't be any better president than I am a candidate. When I compare Jimmy to the other men who have been president and who are running for president, I know that he's better than they are. I know he's he's more intellectual he he knows he knows everything that he needs to know right now one thing he knows for sure is how he'd handle those arabs make it clear to the arab countries in no uncertain terms that uh, if they ever again try to blackmail this nation as it did in 1973 by declaring an embargo against us that we would consider it instantly not a military, but an economic declaration of war. And that we would respond in, in like terms and declare a total embargo against them, not ship them any food, no weapons, no spare parts for weapons, no oil drilling rigs, no oil pipe, no nothing. I believe people in this country are looking for a candidate for president You're in. who can form... who can form an intimate relationship between myself and you now and maintain that closeness between the center of our government and the people of this country after I'm in the White House next January. And I think what we've done here in New Hampshire today will be a very good projection of how the New England people feel about me. Let me say one more thing, and then comes a big test, as you well know, when there's going to be primarily a two-man race in Florida on the 9th of March. We're going to take it! Right. And if I could just move Carter's army to Massachusetts and to Florida, I don't think anybody can beat us. It's going to be a very quick decision. I think first ballot. Taking two cues from Jack Kennedy's strategy, Carter gets an early start, and his appeal to minorities gives him the black vote, the deciding margin in many primaries. One time Martin Luther King aide, Andrew Young, sees to that. Fall back at him, folks. Right here. Fall back at him. Fall back at him. Fall back at him. Fall back at him. Fall back Though Carter looks to be the easy winner at the convention in New York, still, the carnival rituals of a meeting of Democrats must be played out. What was a crime at Nuremberg is now part of the Democratic platform. 
This man is Jimmy Carter, an uncommon man who is now running for the Democratic nomination for president. It's been a long, hard fight. But as his campaign promotion promised those many months ago, Jimmy does make it. But what happened to all those other guys? I formally withdraw my national I candidacy. To spend, to spend my candidacy. I'm today uh, ending my active... I will no longer campaign for the presidency. So it wasn't really defeat. So we didn't know what to call it, and we just decided to call it quits. This is the end. Ridiculous. This is the champ, a mandrel, not a chimp. And he can make you look like a chump. His name is Blue, the champ in a game of reflexes at the Portland, Oregon Zoo. the manual's mercy. You have to wait until the manual decides he wants to play. The way he does that is to push the big round disc on the top of his device. That lights for the human player uh, something that says, if you want to play, deposit a dime. When he plays against the human, lights simultaneously come on at random on his board and on the human's board. And whoever touches the randomly lighted position first wins. If the animal gets it first, he's won one game, and they play until they win a set of three. It's like a three out of five. And uh, the first one who gets three gets rewarded. If it's the animal, he gets a piece of his favorite food for it. This mandrel is spectacularly good, and he beats almost every visitor. and he once in a while looks very proud when he just has beat the heck out of you. He won. Yeah, he won. <laughs> oh, I lose. Give me some other guy. Well, hurry up and put in. Okay. Got that one. You won. Yes, I won. Mm -hmm. Sorry, pal. Can't win them all. In a daring 4th of July rage, these Israeli commandos rescue 100 hostages held at Entebbe Air Base. This Air France plane taking off from Tel Aviv is hijacked and flown to Idi Amin's Uganda. The Arabs demand release of 53 terrorists, most of them held in Israel. When Israel agrees to negotiate, about 150 of the 258 hostages are released. Coming in on this camouflaged C-130, are hostages held captive for a week. The impossible has happened, said Radio Israel, and that's the mood of the thousands at Tel Aviv's Ben Gurion Airport, welcoming hostages and raiders back. The celebration spreads through the streets, and the story is told of the daring raid by 200 commandos who killed the terrorists and perhaps a 100 of Idi Amin's troops, losing only their commando leader and three hostages. One hostage is left behind, Mrs. Doris Block taken ill before the raid. She is never seen again. <laughs> Premier Yitzhak Rabin praises the commandos and tells the Knesset that Israel will protect its citizens and brothers even if it must do so alone. The man who organized the raid and trained the commandos, Defense Minister Shimon Perez. It is a group belonging to the PLO headed by a gentleman named Wadia Haddad, who specialized in hijacking planes, in shooting them down, and is apparently the only organization today which continues to do it. He has two bases, one in Somalia, nearby Uganda. I think that is the reason why the plane was brought or landed in Uganda. And as a matter of fact, we know that while in the plane there were four hijackers, an additional three or four came in to Uganda after the plane 
has landed already. And apparently they were brought in by the private plane of Idi Amin. Even. A vociferous champion of Arab causes for years, Amin's role in the hijacking never becomes clear. He says Israel betrayed him. Hostages say the terrorists and Amin's troops seem to be in it together. In professional sports, $1.7 million a year is spent on admission to see highly paid athletic stars, the new cardboard heroes. We've had the image through all the years of the cardboard hero, however false that image might be. And it is true that the overwhelming majority, I think it's true, of the establishment public uh, not only conjured with that cardboard image, but loved it. And in fact, we had the scene in this country and still have of parents trying to project their responsibilities onto the shoulders of the athletic hero who really has no part in their family life at all. What a terrible thing that Jim Bouton wrote that Mickey Mantle went to the ballpark with a hangover. My goodness, parents said, what are you doing to my child? And so professional sport will grow and grow and grow. It will also grow for business reasons. It will grow because operators can make a lot of money out of sport. It's money because it's entertainment. Whether the stage is the rink, the track, the court, or the ring. It's money that induces Muhammad Ali to fight a Japanese wrestler. And the super showman gives a great pre-bout performance. Look at him, too nervous to eat meat. Can't even get the food in his thing right. Spoon almost missed his mouth. <laughs> no kidding, look at him. Look at him, having trouble getting the food. I don't blame you, boy. I'd be scared, too, fighting somebody as crazy as I am. <laughs> understand that which he cannot understand. He likes to be mystified. Tell him that Count Dracula meets the Wolfman on Horror Mountain. The line will be 50 miles long. Tell him that there's some shark named Jaws eating people up. I'll sell all the movies. First man wanted to go to the moon. For years, he won us on the moon. He went back and paid $10 billion for two rocks. Came back. Now you don't give a damn about the moon. Now he wants to move on Mars. Man wants to go up. He always wants to seek in knowledge. This happens from infancy. Little babies always trying to walk before the time. They love to see blood in this civilization. They like to go to watch a car race. Wanting to see it, not wanting to see somebody get killed. They love. Now the, they will be mystified. And now they will all be waiting. Can you interpret such knowledge? <laughs> Most boxers can't talk. Joe Frazier, George Foreman, if they were here, are you gonna go shape like that? I'm in right here. I knock him out. I mean, they took a shape. I mean, run his mouth every day. I eat raw steaks and I, I raise it. And the most fighters, they go to promote a fight. He go take a picture of some flowers, and he'll smell the flowers. George Foreman, Joe Frazier, put on blonde wigs to promote their fight. One was George Washington, black as he is, calling himself George Washington. <laughs> they couldn't make me do nothing that silly, but that's all they can do. They literate. But I'm wise. <laughs> I have an imagination. So I'm going to lay around the rope and pop him on his nose. And, and if he should ever take me down, I'll grab the rope. <laughs> then I get back up on his behind and shake it off and dance again. Pop, pop, build my points up. Pop, one of each round gets five points. Loser gets four less. Just stick him in his nose and keep popping the rope. Pop. Pop, keep hailing the ropes, and if he tackle me again, grab the rope. And that's just what he does. They're off. 
whether by horse or by car, they're all on their way to capture the greatest number of fans and dollars. Sport, the fastest growing industry in the money spectrum. Money is the key, and a lot of that comes from television. TV sport gives viewers suspense. Sport's capacity for suspense is the key to a fantastic film, The Man Who Skied Down Everest. It's the story of Japanese athlete Yugichiro Miura. I try to write a letter to my daughter to tell her about my dreams and my ambitions, but my mind wanders. There have been many summits, many adventures, but this is different. Something has happened to me. The film by Canadian Budge Crawley wins an Oscar for the best documentary feature. The camera crew is Japanese. I'm going to a glacier called Shangri-La, about two days' walk from here, to make some tests, skiing with a parachute. To mark the speed and direction of the wind, flares are attached to my boots, and a videotape record is made. A parachute could break my speed on icy slopes, but if it is too large, the wind might catch it and pull me off course. It is a vertical ascent of 3,000 feet. Clinging to this desperate ice wall, there is no room for any mistake. This is not a place that you can change danger into mere difficulty. Miura speaks of the legendary Greek who flew too near the sun, melting the wax of his wings and dropping him into the sea. For the first time, I am afraid. I feel lonely and burdened. I worry about failing more than dying. I think of Icarus, who flew too close to the sun. Death would be an easy way out. A big year for women. Not only do they get into the Air Force Academy and West Point and Annapolis, but they can get abortions without a husband's consent, and they're eligible for road scholarships. The Pope says again that their chief job is looking after the family. There are 109,000 women in the armed forces, 5.2% of the force. 5% of the officers are women. But before 1976, the military academies were off limits. Founded in 1845, the Naval Academy at Annapolis will never be the same. Okay, thank you. Purpose Jim, which is going to be to the left, and Miss Irwin, you're going to go to uh, a different place here in the men's locker room. You're going to be issued your uniform now, okay? Government issue now specifies Miss Universe panties, legs pantyhose, and maiden forms shape me sweetly bras. Well, shiver me timbers. It's for combat officers, and the way Congress has it now, women cannot serve as combat officers. So I think it's a waste of a lot of money. To go to the academy, I don't think that it's fair that the men be, you know, singled out to do combat and not the women too. If we're going to go, we might as well go all the way. Going all the way used to mean something else. The Army decides to let female cadets take karate instead of boxing and wrestling. The Air Force allows flexed arm hangs instead of pull-ups. And the Army finds a rifle that's two pounds lighter than the one issued to male cadets. So surely, the Navy will find a way around this problem. Meantime, that old tradition of chivalry saves the day.
They may prefer karate to wrestling at the military academy, but women wrestling in the mud is a big thing in some cities. I've shown automobiles, shown horses, shown dogs, and the big thing always is the win, the real win, and uh, just the same in mud wrestling. The spectators are ready. The wrestlers parade their outfits. One deposits her gum. The ref wants a mud guard. And now, for a little good, clean fun. Or maybe, here's mud in your eye. husband and I were watching one night. She found out, wow, you mean for 12 minutes I can make either 40 or $60 just for tumbling around in the mud? So I thought, well, I'll just try it. You know, the worst that can happen is I'll make $40 one night. Like the man said, the big thing is winning in dog shows or in mud wrestling. But in mud wrestling, you don't always know who won until you've hosed them down. <laughs> the male tourist to Bangkok coming in on special charter flights, finds the mysteries of the Orient available at a price, and it's hardly occidental. Once they leave the airport, their bags go to the hotel, and they themselves go to the massage parlor. It started as diversion for American GIs on R&R, &R, rest and recreation from Vietnam, though no one recalls resting. Now, male tourists, most of them German, look through the one-way glass to pick out the lady of their choice. The Germans have trouble with the names of Thai women, so it's all done by the numbers. Do the girls mind? Well, they're watching Bonanza reruns on television. I tell customer, sit down, then I turn water in bath, then I keep him massage. Uh, usually, North American come here. Japanese, German, French, most Europe, European now. Uh, nothing matter. I like them all. I would say they are different, yes. Sure. They are smaller. They are, they are like, uh, we say in Germany, Kätzchen, the, uh, the kittens. Kittens are usually given away, but in the mysterious East, there's no other place where you can find this type of girls with this type of mentality as this price. In the tourist literature at your local travel agency, they'll tell you that the people of Thailand are known for their sincere sense of hospitality at all levels of society. Paid $14,000 a year by the government, Liz Ray says she can't even type. But her book, The Washington Fringe Benefit, is a bestseller. I don't feel guilty. I only told the truth. How Can many men do you mention in your Gray book? Ordered you to have relations with Senator Mike no comment. How many men are mentioned in your book? Have you read the book? Yes. Well, can't you count? No. Well, I'm sorry. I can't either. Might be interested in acting. Is that true? Just a possibility, yes. Do you think you're talented? I know I am. Her talent is prized especially by Ohio Congressman Wayne Hayes, right up to the time he is about to marry his second and much younger wife, who sticks by him through thick and thicker as he resigns his duties heading various committees. Uh, 
I have decided to call a meeting of the campaign committee for Wednesday, June the 9th, to ask that a temporary chairman be elected until a charge against me has been resolved. I have also decided to call a meeting of the Committee on House Administration next week to discuss with them any questions concerning my role as chairman of the House Administration Committee. Thank you very much. He finally resigns from Congress and goes back to Ohio with his young wife and his $30,000 a year pension. He's going to be all right. How do you feel now that this has been in the press for as many weeks as it has? Are you sorry for the allegations you made? I feel exhausted. That's how I feel. And I just didn't realize, you know, that this thing was going to turn into something like this. I I had no idea I would have been frightened to death, which, like I am, if I had known anything like this was going to happen from, you know, what happened two or three weeks ago. Would you have done it? No way. No way. The man who founded the Chinese Communist Party 55 years ago is dead at 82. Despite a series of strokes, his death comes as a shock following, as it does, by eight months, the death of Zhou Enlai. More than 300,000 view Mao's body in the Great Hall in Peking during the eight-day mourning period. Mao is the only leader many of them have known through his 20-year struggle to oust Chiang Kai-shek and in 27 years of the People's Republic. The man whose little red book, The Sayings of the Chairman, is more widely circulated than the Bible. The son of a peasant, Mao Zedong, has no rival in the history of China, with the possible exception of Confucius, another great reformer and revolutionary thinker. Confucius urged that government lead the people by virtue. Mao preferred more direct action. He hoped to see his people shed their old superstitions and become socially and politically responsible he had to overcome the ignorance, disease, famine, and poverty which had plagued China for centuries. Mao's widow and several other radicals are purged by the party within days, accused of having tried to forge Mao's will and take over leadership. Forged wills are a problem, too, after the death of America's mystery man, Howard Hughes. Once a record-holding daredevil pilot many predicted would die in a plane, at 70, the shriveled 90-pound recluse dies as he is flown from Acapulco to a Houston, Texas emergency ward. When did you first know Howard Hughes was dead? Oh, about two minutes before we landed. He, it, the, the doctor had been checking his, uh, heartbeat up until that point. He said it was getting very weak, about half an hour out, and uh, I don't know, about a minute or so out, he said, no hurry. So I guess that's when he died. He just looked like he really hadn't eaten anything in quite a while, and he just hadn't taken care of himself very well, and that sort of thing. You know, like he was all shriveled up almost. He just wasn't much left of him, what I could see. I didn't get a very good look at him, but getting on the airplane, you could see a little bit of his you know, his face and all getting on. His hair was uh, pretty scraggly. Sort of long, he had a beard, mustache, and uh, just, you know, he didn't really know what was going on or anything. He built his own motorcycle as a teenager, and he builds the wooden spruce goose in World War II. He makes movies in the 30s, and some say his interest is more than cultural in Harlow, and Ava Gardner, and Jane Russell, his outlaw heroine. And Julie Newmar's photo is in his private pinup collection. At 18, he inherited 60% of the Hughes Tool Company, the backbone of a fortune he expanded to an estimated $2.3 billion. Later, many had the will to try to collect, but few came to mourn. He'd lived so long in isolation, some question whether the body is really Hughes. 
but the FBI's fingerprint file confirms the fact. The dashing young pilot of the 30s dies as he lived in mystery. The cells in the human body make up the body's own immune system, its defense against disease. Immunology, in some ways a new science, goes back to the 5th century BC, when Greek physicians noted that persons who survived the plague never got the disease again. In our own century, the best known immunologist is Dr. Jonas Salk, whose near miracle vaccine stopped polio. The immune system is the most complex system in the body after the brain. Its main agents are antibodies and lymphocytes, which are continuously decaying and renewing. In these few minutes, your body has produced 10 million new lymphocytes and a million billion new antibodies. The immune system may be the key to preventing and curing many diseases of man, even cancer. The director of the Institute of Immunology at the University of Toronto, Dr. Bernard Senator. Complex interrelated variable systems have to be regulated with respect to one another, with respect to the substances that are being removed by them. In other words, there are whole uh, levers, switches of the immune system which regulate it. And if you want to utilize the immune system, uh, utilize it in, in a medical or surgical context, you have to understand what these switches are, what these levers are, and how you can operate them. And if you want to have a definition of the contemporary tasks of immunology, if you want to have a kind of generalization of where immunology is going within the framework of modern medicine, it is to determine what these switches and what these levers are and to turn them on or off as our medical or surgical objectives demand this. Immunology may save this child. Elsa was born with a malfunctioning immune system. She lives in an isolation room, not exposed to the microorganisms present in a natural environment. In an unprotected world, these microorganisms would kill her. At Toronto's Hospital for Sick Children, Dr. Erwin Gelfand of the Department of Immunology. The immune system, the cells of the immune system, provide the patient or the person with the ability to fight infections in their environment. As a result of partial deficiencies or complete deficiencies of these cell systems, uh, children or adults are unable to lead normal lives. Elsa's problem centers in the thymus gland, a key part of the body's immune system. Elsa has been given a thymus gland transplant, and she is showing improvement. She should soon be able to live in the normal world. But for now, every precaution must be taken to be certain no germs are brought into her from that outside world. Her world is artificially created and controlled. She breathes specially clean air. Toys, bedding, instruments, everything she is to be around must be purified by an ultraviolet light housed in this box. Her parents and the medical staff are masked and gowned in sterile robes. Thirty-eight North Americans die of cancer each hour of the day. Jonas Salk believes immunology may be the answer, and Dr. Gelfand agrees. I think it's clear to us that immunology is a medical discipline that has no boundaries. It crosses most boundaries. The cardiologists, the endocrinologists are dealing with certain specific areas of medicine, whereas in immunology we have the hope of dealing with endocrinology, with cardiac diseases, with the development of treatment against cancer, leukemia, as well as the provision of specific, rational and appropriate therapy to children who are born without an immune system. Every so often, a new killer disease appears that the immune system can't handle. That's how it is when some 2,000 war veterans come to Philadelphia for the 58th Annual Convention of the American Legion. Three of these men from Bloomsburg, Pennsylvania, contract the disease. William Baird, far right, dies of it. In all, 178 persons are stricken. 29 die. Their symptoms? Much like a heavy cold. 
Most of them are legionnaires who had some contact with Philadelphia's 72-year-old luxury hotel, the Bellevue Stratford. And because of the publicity, it finally is closed. After the legionnaires are gone, Philadelphia hosts the Catholics' Eucharistic Congress. And the headlines are scary, though no one then contracts the disease. The hotel, memory filled for so many, had been Harold Stassen headquarters when he was trying for the Republican nomination in 1948 and Democratic headquarters the same year. Helen Berenson has lived there for years. It certainly didn't do us any good, but they used to say about it, they blame it on the legendary disease, blame it on the Bellevue water, and blame it on the Bellevue thing, food, which the, I don't think the legendary people ever ate a thing here. They brought their beer in and put it in bathtubs. Do you think the legionnaires got their disease here? I certainly do not. Now, how about today, with the doctors were here yesterday afternoon, a lot of them, and today now they're blaming it on a pigeon and blaming it on a, on a stray dog. The chief medical detective on the case, Dr. David Sensor. We were saying as early as the fourth or fifth day after the outbreak that we might never have a definitive answer there. Uh, it would be nice to uh, always have an answer for everything, but that's, science isn't always that way. Are you coming to the conclusion now that perhaps there will never be an answer to Legionnaire's disease? Uh, I think that's a very, very good possibility. What are the implications of that, Dr. Sensor? Well, I think it, it sort of um, uh, humbles us and, and makes us realize that there are things that we just don't know. Uh, right now we have a team in Africa investigating an outbreak of a disease that has never been described before. That one, we have been able to isolate a an agent for it, but it's a completely new agent. Uh, uh, nature frequently is well ahead of us. It looks like the biggest 4th of July ever, or maybe a scene from an old and bad movie. But actually, it's the reenactment of the historic Battle of Long Island when the troops of King George III soundly defeated old George Washington and sent him scurrying off to Valley Forge. It's bicentennial time, a time for celebrating the 200th anniversary of the birth of the nation. It all began, you remember, with 13 colonies. And when Betsy Ross sewed up a flag, General Washington didn't want to see her work all go to waste. Or something like that. Anyway, the stars and stripes just multiplied and multiplied. Richard Nixon was supposed to be the president for this 200th birthday but he loitered too long at the Watergate, and so... The wounds of our parting in 1776 healed long ago. Americans admire the United Kingdom as one of our truest allies and best friends. In 70 years, there was a formal constitutional link between us. Your Declaration of Independence broke that link, but it did not for long break our friendship. Wonder what George III would have said about that. Everybody figures old Jerry will probably stumble and knock the queen down, but he makes it safely through the day. All over America, the redcoats are coming off and on all year long, reenacting one battle or another or just marching in parades. There are enough parades to accommodate everyone with a secret wish to ride in an open car. There's Happy and Vice President Rockefeller. He isn't running for re-election this year, so he fills in for President Ford. There's Johnny Cash and Telly Savalas. There's lots of local color in 76. 
but the official ones are red, white, and blue. You can get most anything you want, as long as those are your favorite hues. T-shirts and beards. Even hamburgers. Yeah. Those must be... Oh, surely they aren't. Yep, they're ice cream cones. And would you look at that? And even guitars and banjos. 1976. Happy birthday, America. <laughs>